At this time, I'd like to call the work session of August 21st, 2024 to order. Call. Roll call. Gonzalez? Here. Brenneman? Here. Haley? Wakes? Here. Mulvaney Henry? Here. Parker? Here. You have a quorum. He is on. Accept uh, a motion for approval of the agenda. So, so moved. Second. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Roll call, Gonzalez. Aye. Brenneman. Aye. Haley. Is he muted? Aye. There. There he okay. is. Wakes. Aye. Mulvaney Henry. Aye. Parker. Aye. That motion carries. Uh, that takes us to item number four, board update, GM update. Does anybody on the board member have an update? They'd like to share. No, sir. Nope. I might just remind everybody that next meeting I will be remotely attending. And um, Mr. Haley, Senator. Um, I'll be honored and uh, to be there in your stead and hope all goes well during your uh, celebration at that time. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, not, nothing for me, Mr. President, at this time. Okay, so then that takes us to the IRP discussion. So this is a continuation. Uh, Andrew, uh, you guys want to sit at the table? Thank you for having me back today. Uh, we're going to have an update on uh, our modeling progress for the IRP. Last time we spoke, we went. Uh, oh, next slide. And one more. Uh, last time we spoke, we uh, we talked about scenarios uh, five, six, seven, and eight: uh, the high and low fuel price sensitivities, the high load growth case, and the high reserve requirement sensitivity. Uh, today we will cover uh, scenarios two through four, and then nine and ten. So that will cover all the scenarios uh, that we are uh, including in this IRP. Next slide. Um, again, just to kind of uh, review, all scenarios uh, are derived from the base case. Uh, each case, each scenario will have a set of modified assumptions to evaluate different sets of future circumstances. Um, here, scenarios two, three, and four uh, are related to possible futures where BPU would take action to change the operation at uh, Nearman Creek 1 to comply with new environmental rules. And we'll discuss in detail uh, these assumptions when we, get, we go through each case individually. Um, scenario nine is the uh, net zero by 2040, which is a uh, net zero carbon case. And then scenario 10 is looking at the effects of retiring the uh, oil-fired combustion turbines at Quindaro in 2028. Um, before we move on, it's probably worth taking a few minutes to talk about some of the terminology when we discuss these cases. Um, when we talk about the model making decisions, when we talk about forced or allowed decisions, um, a forced decision is something that the modeling team has worked together and come up with a condition that we manually enter into the model to define a particular scenario. Uh, for example, in scenario two, uh, we look at the co-firing of natural gas at Hearman Creek One. Um, that is a forced decision. It's it's a it's a given uh, condition to define that scenario. A choice that we allow the model to make on its own. We'd say it, uh, and on this date, the operation of the plant will change in a certain way because that's what we want to evaluate. Um, 
So in scenario two, we also have a forced enforced decision that Nearman one has to retire no later than the end of 2038. And, and that's related to the uh, EPA rules that we're trying to evaluate a response to them. Um, but contrasting that with an allowed decision um, in scenario two, just like in all the other scenarios, all of the thermal power plants are allowed to retire at any time after 2028. So in scenario two, we force the model to retire Nearman Creek 1 no later than the end of 2038, but it could retire any time between 2028 and the end of 2038. So when we when we see the results, those are the, the um, those are the type of decisions that are going in, and I'll I'll mention what things are being forced and what things are being allowed uh, in those results. Okay, let's uh, go on. Um, again, to review um, the base case, and we talked about this some time ago. The expansion plan for the base case shows that in the near to medium term, firm capacity needs can be met with limited amounts of purchase capacity. Uh, and again, those are you know, bilateral agreements between BPU and other market participants for the, the right to firm capacity. Um, starting in 2038, within the base case, uh, there are additional firm capacity needs uh, that result in the addition of uh, solar resources, solar farms. And a total of 75 megawatts of solar capacity is added through the end of this planning period. Uh, 2038 is a key year within our set of assumptions because that coincides with the end of the, or the planned end of the uh, 200 megawatt Cimarron Bend wind contract. And when that expires, uh, there is a, a amount of firm capacity that goes with that. That's why 2038 uh, we'll see over and over again as being an important year uh, in this IRP. All right. Next slide, please. So scenario two, uh, like we said, this is one of the scenarios where we look at the effects of new environmental rules on the operation of one. Scenario two looks at a future where compliance with these uh, carbon emission rules is achieved through modifying the plant to burn natural gas in addition to coal. Uh, natural gas is a cleaner burning fuel, and so co-firing that natural gas with, uh, with coal will reduce overall CO2 emissions. Um, under the uh, EPA rules, uh, they would want to see a mixture of 60% coal and 40% natural gas like on a heat input basis, uh, starting no later than 2030. Uh, and again, under those rules, the uh, modification of the plant to burn natural gas would allow it to continue operating until the end of 2038, at which point it would be required to retire. And that's where we get to that forced decision uh, in the model. Um, that's an enforced retirement due to uh, the EPA rules. Doesn't mean it has to run that long, but it can't, under this uh, scenario, it couldn't run too long. I would also take this opportunity to mention that these uh, new CO2 emission rules while they have been finalized by the EPA, uh, there are still active legal challenges. So their future is still sort of up in the air as those legal challenges play out. I know Ingrid is keeping her, keeping her eye on that. Next slide, please. Look at the results. Um, just like in the base case, uh, Purchase capacity, again, is sufficient to meet BPs uh, up until 2038. 
uh, in this scenario, uh, and uh, there's a solar build out starting in 2038. Uh, that's the same as seen in the base case with a total of 75 megawatts being added. Um, however, if we look at um, the black and gray lines on that chart, uh, the upper black line is the uh, calculated uh, annual generation value for Nearman Creek One uh, from the base case. The gray line would be the calculated generation from Nearman Creek One in scenario two. You'll notice starting uh, once the conversion takes place, the amount of generation decreases. And this is expected uh, following the conversion to burn natural gas with coal. That's going to cause an, an increase in fuel costs. The increase in fuel costs is going to uh, make the plant slightly less competitive when it bids into the market, so it will generate less. Now, uh, what we well, what else we can see in this graph is uh, there in 2039, there's the enforced retirement of Nearman Creek One. So its generation drops to zero. Well, simultaneously, we see a, a blue line pick up, and that is from uh, a new generation source that the model has added for a 237 megawatt simple cycle natural gas fired combustion turbine. Um, works out where uh, the uh, capacity of Nearman Creek uh, One is 235 megawatts in the model. And so this combustion turbine is just almost a drop-in replacement. Uh, and so you'll see that its generation uh, picks up in 2039, and it's actually fairly similar to what was predicted for Nearman Creek 1 in the base case. Now, again, the, because it runs on natural gas, its, it's cost will be a little higher. Uh, fuel, fuel costs will be a little higher than if it was, you know, Nearman Creek 1 running on coal. But... Um, that new uh, combustion turbine is going to represent uh, much more advanced technology, and it's a much more efficient plant. So it can burn that fuel more efficiently. Any questions on the uh, results of scenario two? Just the, uh, the gas uh, fuel cost. I don't think it'll decrease with the demand. Forecast of natural gas prices. Um, you know, as um, we look into the future, we are looking at increased demand for natural gas. As there are a lot of coal units out there that are going to retire, that base load is going to be uh, replaced by natural gas fired units. And so, um, well, we can't be certain of the future. We're expecting prices to uh, remain such high enough that uh, they'll be higher on a on a uh, per MMBTU basis than than coal has been. I just wanted to clarify, and I know there's a couple major hurdles here, but with the current EPA rules, if if they hold up in court, mm -hmm. and if a future EPA leadership doesn't institute new rules. That's sort of the scenario, too. That's the 2038 deadline in order to be compliant with that set of rules, which, again, has to survive multiple hurdles for that to be true in 2038, but that's that's sort of the status quo. Yeah, it, it would be that those rules remain in effect. We're not anticipating a new rule in this scenario. It's just that survives this process. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, please. Where? Do you come up to my... <laughs> You set up your uh, this would have to be committed into a state plan prior to this timeline. Um, we're actually slated to start those discussions this October with the state and other Kansas utilities to begin that process as we have in the past with all the other greenhouse gas rules. Um, but so that then solidifies whatever we've opted in to choose. Um, so the 40% co-fire natural gas is the first step. 
And then by 2039, December, you would have to provide in which Chuck will get into the carbon capture. So, but that that is by 2030 is the key date of co commitment. Um, and once you've chosen a pathway, you're tied to that pathway via the state plans. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and also there, there is another option, uh, which is do nothing. And under those uh, EPA rules, um, you can choose to do nothing, but then Near Marine Creek One would have to be retired by uh, uh, 2032. So I'm sorry, just to clarify, on Ingrid, on your point, the commitment by 2030 is switching to that higher percentage of natural gas, not committing to the retirement. Or am I misunderstanding? So there's the first option is <clears throat> methane operate as we stand today and retire by the 2030. 2032. Or 32, excuse me. And by 20, but, but committing by 2030. So all of them you're committing by 2030 via the, these uh, state obligation, right? Um, and it's a legally binding choice. The other is a 40% co-firing of natural gas. Um, and then after that, December 2039 date is um, the option for carbon capture sequestration. Um, it's not the only solution, but they're looking for, um, you know, a 90% reduction in um, CO2 emissions. Um, that's one of the technologies they've thrown out. That's one that's been contested the most and being part of the biggest legal challenge to all of this uh, because it's not a proven technology. Um, there's one, a few units that have been demonstrating this or trying to demonstrate this, but they're not able to achieve those, those efficiencies at that, that percent capture. Thank you. But they are capturing some, just not the level that they expect? Correct. Nobody can get to that. Okay. That's right. Well, once we're locked into this, as I know things have changed in the past, will there changes occur if there's change in administration or differences? Yeah. Oh, my microphone was off. <laughs> or is so we we um there's been a challenge by many folks, uh, industry and, and power facilities and other industry, quite frankly. Um, there also is opposition and in support of this regulation. Um, the DC circuit um, refused to um, provide a stay for this. So it's now being requested with utilities of which we're one that uh, there be an emergency stay request for this regulation. The biggest problem of this, you've, you've all heard about the inf um, IRA, Biden's uh, Infrastructure Reduction Act that's you know providing funds for build out of carbon capture pipelines, all sorts of things, hydrogen and all of that. Um, and really for, uh, for utilities to be able to achieve these timelines, that infrastructure really needs to start yesterday and definitely by 2025 January 1 but really yesterday and the infrastructure it's not there we, we haven't started um at least and unfortunately our region is usually one of the last to kind of get in on some of these you know California and some others on the east coast are well more um, situated in a better position so to speak um, but for us we we are not in that position just some preliminary upfront things I've looked at when it comes to carbon capture. And I know those, that I've been asked to present on all of this in a separate board meeting, which or work session, whichever, which I will do to elaborate more on what I presented. But, you know, for us looking at a carbon capture for Nearman, there is nothing within our area. Um, we would have to have the infrastructure or pipeline to go, the closest would be near Topeka or just outside of Topeka. Um, to, to do the the third option with this regulation. Okay. That's an excellent segue into uh, next slide, uh, which is looking at 
you know, so the Ingrid and the Angie and I, I think have talked about, you know, there's a lot of legal legal ramifications here. I mean, we don't want to get into conversations as to, as to uh, anything other than what's been publicly made available, you know, through the press, through uh, other outsourced efforts, federal government or, or what we've learned through APPA or anybody, anybody else. So, yes. I mean, that's... Yes, a, a deeper dive we could do in an executive session into those issues. Okay, uh, so scenario three, just what uh, Ingrid was talking about, which is the kind of the third uh, most uh, stringent option for uh, reducing carbon emissions from uh, near Main Creek One. Um, so this looks at uh, the potential impacts of a decision like that to modify the plant, to capture the carbon that's being emitted, and then transport it offsite for you know permanent geologic storage sequestration. Uh, so in this scenario, uh, the carbon capture and sequestration uh, retrofit is manually forced to occur. It's not a decision given to the model. We, we force it to occur uh, getting to 2032 because that's what we want to evaluate. Um, and so as a result of this retrofit, Nearman Creek One can continue running through the end of the planning period and beyond. That's what the, the EPA rule would allow. There's no enforced retirement uh, date associated with it, a plant that has chosen to retrofit a carbon capture system. Uh, but again, within the model, it, the, there's an allowed decision where it could be retired if if conditions warrant. You know, following the uh, following the retrofit. Um, again, as Ingrid said, there is a, an implicit assumption in this scenario that a pipeline will be built and operated by a third party to allow that carbon to be carried off site. Is no such pipeline uh, in this region today. And pipelines uh, can be expensive to build. Uh, and and I never heard of anyone successfully sequestering uh, <laughs> carbon. Is that is that has that been happening? Has that been happening? It, yes, it has been. And and there's a lot of oil and gas that, in Western Kansas that are doing that. I've sat on the. Um, <clears throat> You know, the Kansas Geological Sur Survey and such, they've had a CCS group for many years. Um, unfortunately, the leader of that went to a different state. And so it kind of, it's starting up again, but um, I've sat on that for years. So that, that is, initially they came to Evergy and BPU and asked if we'd be a, you know, volunteer in that type of um, project. And I think Evergy did a small scale near Jeffrey. However, um, that they opted to go to where it's a little bit easier and those refineries and things are, are closer to that, to the good geology, right? To where you can have that salt dome and, and inject that carbon where it's naturally available in existence and existing. Um, we don't have that here. There's other ways to do that, like a class six well, where you would just inject it deep down. We don't, you know, at Nearman, we're right on the river. We don't have that type of geology. So, but there are, facilities, not necessarily power plants, doing this routinely. Thank you. But there are a lot of, I'm just going to say, there's a lot of opposition, even from environmental groups, about the carbon capture and neighbors not wanting it, obviously. Well, and one of the options uh, for uh, disposing of carbon captured in an industrial facility is to uh, inject it into uh, oil and gas fields to help stimulate production. Which is controversial in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, once within the model, the the carbon capture retrofit is complete. Uh, one of the things that has to be considered is the the net output of Nearman Creek One will be reduced. In the model we reduce it from two hundred thirty five megawatts where it's at today down to 165 megawatts. Um, this is due to the power requirements for all the equipment that would need to be operated to run the carbon capture system. Um, and so 
when the maximum capacity of maximum net capacity of Nearman Creek One is reduced, there is a corresponding reduction in its firm capacity. We've talked about how you know that that's the the uh, kind of binding constraint in a lot of these scenarios is making sure BPU has enough firm capacity online to meet its uh, reliability requirements in SPP. And so uh, in addition to uh, any other build out requirements that would occur due to other changes in the system, um, there would have to be additional generating resources brought online to make up for this loss of uh, output uh, due to the carbon capture system. That's above and beyond the cost for the system itself um, at a high level, um, using kind of, you know, generic industry numbers and in comparison with other facilities that we've studied that um, are looking at carbon capture uh, technology, very high level. Again, we didn't do a detailed study, but a very high level estimate would place a retrofit like this around $700 million. Probably from where it was. Would, would 700 50, yeah. Seven, uh, $700 million oh, 700. or more. more. Again, that doesn't, that doesn't pay for the pipeline. <laughs> what is it? 237 megawatt uh, uh, CT cost. That was a, one of the, I, I don't have that number. It's not 700 million. <laughs> no. So in, in some of the previous presentations, you know, depending on what type of generating source, uh, you select it's from eight hundred dollars to I think it's two thousand dollars a kW, so it's well less than than that number. Obviously, that that number is substantially higher. Um, so it, yes, it's very expensive related relative to a a normal gas build out that you would do. So and the reason that um, in this scenario that if we go to the next slide, uh, the reason that the plant is not replaced is because we forced it to do the retrofit. You know, again, that's what we were trying to evaluate is the effects of if the retrofit was chosen, as opposed to is the retrofit the least cost option? Uh, we wanted to see what the effects would be. Um, these increased costs of running the system, the carbon capture system, Decrease output and, and the costs of transporting the carbon dioxide offsite for its permanent storage result in Aaron Creek One no longer really being economic to dispatch it. You can see again, there's that uh, black line showing the, the Aaron Creek One generation in the base case, and then the gray line um, is the, the generation expected in scenario three. Uh, capacity factor. Uh, drops down to less than 1%. Interestingly, the model does not retire near Ring Creek 1 in this scenario uh, because it is still able to claim the firm capacity. And since it's already built, there's, there's, it's not a replacement cost. And since we forced it to retrofit, um, it just keeps it as a recurring unit that, that doesn't run. Uh, but these results results do bring into question the, the value of, of this sort of retrofit at, at near mid one. We don't have a scenario that would just show, I mean, because it is all but retiring it in 2032, right? I mean, in, and that's built in, right? So we're not looking at comparing the $750 million cost to invest there versus um, a gas-fired plant or solar, but... There's not a comparable scenario that just says, well, obviously we're not doing that. What does it look like if functionally this is a 2032 retirement? We don't have that gamed out. Uh, we don't uh, have a specific scenario okay. for that, but it would look very similar, I think, to the um, uh, scenario two, where when Nearman Creek One retires, it's replaced so immediately bumping that up. with a, uh, a natural gas fired unit. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I do want to say that um, there are proposed rules, regulations on uh, new combustion turbines, of which we're talking about, that EPA 
um, with the proposed rate rule, it's final now, but when they proposed it, they pulled out um, that new, the, the uh, new generation left in, right? So that there are gonna be strict regulations for, for that as well. Right. That, that's, a, that's, that. that's an excellent that. point of where we see in that scenario where the, the new uh, combustion turbine is added, um, under the EPA rules, if there are uh, new uh, natural gas fired units that are built after a certain date, they also have requirements for carbon capture if their capacity factor is very high. And in this particular circumstance, we're forecasting that that would be below that limit. So as long as the power plant was run in accordance with best industry practices, it could continue to operate without those uh, carbon capture. Uh, yeah. And it's the reason this scenario just to pretty massive investment in solar as opposed to the one before is because you've already got the capacity from near end, so you don't have to go build something that gets you your maximum capacity number and just the generation from solar is cheaper at that point? Um, well, it has to, uh, the solar has to uh, replace <laughs> the same loss of firm capacity that we saw in the base case. Mm -hmm plus the loss of firm capacity from the decreased output of Nearman 1. Well, I guess what I'm asking is scenario two, right? The obvious scenario is we basically do a light replacement with natural gas. Yeah. This one, you're almost retiring it, but not quite, and it's investing in solar as opposed to the natural gas. Is that because you've already got the benefit of m most of the Nearman capacity? Yes. You just don't have to use it? Correct. So the generation itself is cheaper on the solar, but not trying to get to the capacity. Right. Well, it's, it's really looking at the cost of, of a firm a megawatt of capacity. Yeah. Um, and it, in this case, it's cheaper to go with the solar for the, the amounts that it's looking at. Does, do we have, is there any scenarios or has anybody looked at if we just got out of the generation business, what would that show or what would that mean? Don't have, I mean, like no BPU owned generation at all. Out of the, yeah, right. Uh, we don't have a scenario for that. I mean, in, in some ways, we we kind of do. We have the, the net zero approach, which again, which generally means we can do purchase power agreements, which is what we do mm -hmm. today on all of those. So that would be obviously us not owning it today. We can own it because of the tax credits the way they work. So we have the ability to, or we could do another mechanism where we essentially, I mean, even dogwood today is we own a portion of that facility, right? And so if the idea is not owning anything, we could do PPAs with also existing gas units or nuke units or what have you. So some, some uh, I'll say co-ops and so forth have just contracts with Evergy, with other entities to contract for that. Um, it it not, isn't anything necessarily cheaper because obviously you got to pay the full freight of what Evergy is doing or any other counterparty that's that's operating those facilities, but you could absolutely get out of the generation business if you wanted to. Obviously, that means generally that all that generation will be outside of your service area and you have to deal with importing that that energy. And therefore we have transmission stuff that we would have to work through to, to I'm make, not suggesting make that I'm not suggesting but, but we could. <laughs> <laughs> but we could. It, it it is a possibility. We could. Tom, I mean, that, that was the, one of the purposes of at least having the option around net zero. And that can be defined in more ways than simply getting out of the generation business. Yep. It's uh, what is the net difference of all of our generation? What is that net difference? You know, zero, two. And uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of thoughts there. Uh, you know, we didn't want to include that so that there's not any, you know, we're not looking past anything. We're considering everything. We're putting every option possible in front of the board so that, you know, the question comes up, did you consider this? Yes, we did. And now it's, it's there. All right. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. Scenario four, again, is another one of these uh, environmental scenarios related to Zierman Creek 1. This is looking at... NOx emissions, nitrogen oxides. Currently, Nearman Creek 1 is, is meeting all of the emission requirements, but uh, anticipating uh, 
future changes, uh, steps would have to be taken to ensure Nearman One remains in compliance. Uh, and, you know, the cost of remaining in compliance, that's gonna require additional money to be spent to operate Nearman One in a, in a slightly different fashion. Um, so this scenario assumes that these additional costs are incurred uh, starting in 2025. And again, it's all related to achieving uh, lower NOx emission rates. Next slide, please. Um, the changes in these operational costs uh, don't impact the expansion as of what you know, we saw in the base case. Uh, firm capacity needs are met with purchase capacity in 2037. In 2038, just like in the uh, base case, solar capacity is added a, a total of 75 megawatts. Solar capacity is ended by the end of the planning period. We can see that the model is projecting that due to these increased costs, there would be uh, a slight decrease in generation at Nearman Creek One relative to the base case. But again, that's that was anticipated, uh, you know, to meet those more stringent. Ox emission limits. Uh, do you have anything to add? Um, well, this is related to the cross state air pollution rule, good neighbor plan um, that the Supreme Court recently stayed that had to do with the challenge on 23 other states, um, Kansas, and I know five or seven states of our, got looped into this. EPA has not, um, actually beginning of this year, EPA has not though yet decided. Um, they partially disapproved our state plan. Initially they approved our plan and then they came back uh, this year and partially disapproved it. So for this, uh, for us, for Kansas, um, even given that there is a stay, EPA would have to formally disapprove our plan for the stay to be uh, to impact Kansas, uh, which they have not yet done. Uh, EPA has gone sort of, so to speak, back to the drawing board to resolve the issues so that the stay is not to satisfy and get the stay lifted. However, the, that's all being legally challenged. So we're, we're kind of in a weird, um, you know, Position, position, position holding pattern. Holding pattern. We're, we're really in a, a unique position. So EPA could either say, well, we're going to wait with Kansas and the others that we, we brought in um, until this is all settled legally, or they could come out and, and, and rule differently. Um, we, we did do some testing to see if we could achieve some of these lower emissions here recently, worked with Dawn and operations, and we were able to do so, but it does obviously increase our cost and there's some other uh, concerns uh, with that as well. So any other questions on scenario four? Uh, scenario nine, uh, this is the uh, net zero by 2040 case. Uh, again, this is a net zero carbon case. Uh, and for this, it was assumed that <clears throat> annual generation from renewable or zero carbon resources would have to be equal to uh, BP's annual load by 2040. And this is all, all on an annual basis. During any one hour, uh, it's not necessary that all the load is met with renewable energy. Uh, this is not a zero carbon option but uh, carbon emissions would be significantly reduced. Uh, what we'll see is within the model, there is a, a lot of renewable resource capacity would have to be added to <coughs> increase renewable generation uh, to the level required. Uh, and we'll also see that um, when we talked about uh, the model being allowed to retire fossil fuel fired generation, uh, we'll see some of that in these results where the, the model does. Next slide. Um, here we see uh, the capacity expansion results for scenario nine. Um, 
mm -hmm. arrow, the, the oil oil fired combustion turbines two and three are retired by the model in 2032 and 2031. Uh, Nearman Creek one is retired by the model in 2038. Again, those are not forced retirements. That's the model retiring them based on uh, economic conditions. Uh, the reason that the model can retire them is because to meet the net zero goal, almost 1,200 megawatts of solar capacity is being built. Um, I'd like to point out that, you know, the model chooses from the expansion candidates that we give it, and solar is uh, one of those. Um, and it chooses it because it meets the criteria we've given it for this scenario. Um, there are some other things to consider when looking at a build out like this. Um, I think first and foremost is a diversity of supply. Um, you wouldn't, you know, put all your eggs in one basket with just solar. Uh, we didn't, uh, limit the model in any way to uh, say you could only build so many megawatts of solar and this is what it shows uh, in the uh, quote unquote real world there are other options as well of course uh, spp is rich in wind resources uh, and they provide a lot of uh, energy for bpu currently uh, and as we look into the future there may be other zero carbon uh, generation options that could become available, uh, things like hydrogen, uh, hydrogen burning combustion turbines or uh, additional nuclear units that, you know, capacity and energy could be bought from as a, as a part owner or as a, through a contract. Um, but what this scenario shows us is more of the magnitude of uh, installed capacity that would be needed to meet a, a net zero goal. Uh, and again, that's not current BPU policy. This is just a what if, what if scenario. So one of the challenges with this approach obviously is it looks only at the assumptions that we know exist today. And so as we build out 1200 megawatts of solar, what are all the other utilities and other companies within SPP doing? And so that will impact the ELCC or effective load carrying capability in Kansas and SPP, just like it has in California today, right? So the effective load carrying capability in California is much, much lower because they have so much solar already today, which is just what we've seen on the wind side, right? The wind, and that's why you're not seeing wind pop up is the effective load carrying capability is so much lower with wind today because we've had that build out. So you would expect some of that transition to occur, even though today in the model, it says, hey, solar is the best option. As you get there, things are gonna change and you're gonna have to grow with that change. But that's exactly what the model's meant to do is allow us to make decisions based off the time when it comes. But today, looking at the model, it says solar is likely your cheapest option, so. Can you speak to why, um, if the, you know, 2040 is the mark we're trying to hit, uh, <clears throat> the model chooses to retire the CT2 and three so much earlier than that and move to solar earlier? Well, it. Uh, there are limitations in how much solar it can build in any given year. Okay, so it gives it sort of a, a, a ramp, ramp up. up. Yeah. And, and what the model is seeing is um, once that solar is built, it doesn't need those high-cost fossil fuel units anymore. If you have to build it early, you might as well use it. Exactly. And so um, what we can see with the, uh, the lines on this graph, that the lower you know, horizontal green line, that's the the 15% capacity reserve margin. Uh, the black line above that is the, the calculated capacity reserve margin within the model for all the, the resources. You can see up until about 2031, it's, it runs very close to 15%. Once that solar begins to be added, the capacity reserve margin increases and keeps getting higher and higher. And then you can actually see in 2038, the significant drop in uh, capacity reserve margin, that's associated with retirement of Nearman Creek One. It can retire it because the retirement wouldn't violate the uh, capacity reserve margin constraint. And so it's cheaper at that point because of all the solar that's been added to, to, to take that plant offline mm -hmm. and, and move forward with the solar. Now, I know we've applied for at least a grant or two around solar. I'm assuming there's not some magic grant out there at this sort of scale that we'd be 
thrilled to, you know, take a big chunk of that cost off. Yes, there it's not. So okay. we, we have um, the solar for all the state of Kansas did not receive. Um, I do think our, our community is going to get some solar for all dollars, um, probably not through the utility itself, but through low income rooftop stuff. So uh, at some point we'll, we'll discuss that, but we do expect some dollars for the solar for all to come back to Wyandotte County. Um, so that's at least a good thing, but no, there, there are no uh, widespread dollars. There are still dollars part of the IRA, not grant dollars, um, that play into it in terms of, I'll say 30% regular tax credit, 10% for, um, I'll say, U.S. built product. And then you can potentially get another 20% for low income project, where essentially half of that revenue goes back to low income households and so forth. So there are some tax credits that you can stack on top of each other um, that we can consider, especially as part of that paper capacity piece that we talk about in those, those early to mid years, um, that those things may be able to replace some of those paper capacity dollars that we're spending there. So are there approaching expiration dates on those credits? So they're, they're not. So we're at 2032 is when the current okay. the tax credits currently expire. Um, and then we'll see if they ever expand it from there, but we, we got some time in there. Fire up. Right. And it, it's really just any investment. So you just have to spend a little bit of dollars saying, hey, I am going to do this, even if you sat on that project for a period of about five years. So you, you, we do have some time to, to move on that front. All right. Uh, I guess we'll move on to scenario 10. This is a somewhat less complicated scenario. Uh, you know, here we're looking at uh, a manually forced retirement in the model of the Quindaro uh, oil-fired CTs in 2028. Uh, this is the earliest retirement uh, contemplated in any of the scenarios. Uh, and as a result, the, uh, you know, because of this forced retirement, the model will then have to replace the, the firm capacity through some uh, new resource. Next slide. Uh, in 2028, the model picks 125 megawatts of solar uh, to replace those units, replace the firm capacity. Uh, I would also point out that uh, the Quindaro units don't run very much. Uh, they're more of a reserve unit uh, where the solar units would be generating more energy on an annual basis. Um, but really, the model is picking them not for their energy, but for the firm capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then additional firm capacity is uh, from more solar is added in 2032 and 2038. So a total of 225 megawatts of solar is added uh, as compared to the, the 75 megawatts uh, at the base case. What's the rationale behind scenario 10, right? We're not, this isn't uh, an attempt to meet any particular regulation, right? We're, we're not making an assumption on Nearman in this. It, it, is there a rationale behind it, it was, other things alone and retiring? The it, it was a staff consideration. So we wanted to really see what the cost differential is between keeping those units versus going in a different approach. And so as we look at those dollars, it'll be, this approach costs X dollars more. Does that make sense to gotcha. do or not do? Um, so we really just want to see that differential in price cost analysis. So it's a you. staff recommendation. But uh, considering that they have to be retired in the future, we have to consider that consideration and the reason why they made that requirement, why it has to be retired in the future, because they're required to, be, to, to reduce emissions, to to uh, make the environment more healthy, uh, whatever, you know, so whatever their rationale for making it necessary that they must be retired in the future, considering it earlier is, is, is I think would be another consideration as to why we would, would consider this scenario. Any other thoughts on scenario 10? Okay, uh, I think that's all I have for you on the modeling of those. Do we have a breakdown? I know we probably 
kind of have two sets of data, right? We looked originally at the cost for production for some of these options, and then we have the models that show how much capacity you'd have to build of these. Do we have that broken down on a, this is what scenario, base case scenario cost the BPU versus scenario 10 or two or whichever? Yeah, we will. Um, it's not part of this presentation. Um, the next time I come back and present, we'll have the, uh, the report and that will have cost information as a part of that. So that's what I'll be presenting at, at our uh, next meeting. When, when, I guess, when do we anticipate that and how quickly is, is the report gonna be generated? Um, it will be in, I think, end of this month, we intend to provide the board with a copy of the uh, final report. And then the next week, uh, Black and Beach will come in and, and do a presentation, uh, talk about the final results, and then take your questions. So we'd anticipate that being so the end of next week, September. The end of next, yeah, the end of the month, next week. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Okay, so you're going to drop that on track for Labor Day weekend. <laughs> is that what I'm hearing? No, seriously, I mean, is that what we're looking at? That, yes. Okay, and then we're going to meet on it on September 3rd. Is that also what I'm hearing? Yes, of course. <laughs> Fourth, sorry, Tom. I know it's your 55th wedding anniversary. Um, <clears throat> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So we need we need to talk about that next meeting because we also on the first meeting in September are supposed to put the uh, customer service policy in front of the full board to get have that conversation. Okay. So I went. We're we're flexible. Uh, I mean, I, I think if there's if there's if we need to reschedule things, we can. I think just from my standpoint, I can't speak for any other board member. I would like to see that report, and I, and the the report that is going to generate with with the costing information in it, right? It, uh, and I'd like to have it for a little bit before we we meet on it. I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Well, so. We can push just if you're available we can okay. for the second meeting in September. I think that should be fine. Far and there's where we have a budget lower. Revenue. September October. When staffing no starts. I'm sorry. When is staffing? I'm sorry. When is staffing? Oh, we're starting then. Okay. Yeah, I mean, do you want this next meeting we're talking about? Would that be another work session? Uh, present kind of digesting that report. Is that the that was the idea? idea. Okay, yeah, and it will really be a recap of all the stuff that you've seen, right? With, with numbers and different pieces, just in written format type thing. So it's uh, revenue forecast. Revenue forecast is September 18th. Staffing is uh, October 2nd. Yeah. Uh, either one of us going to take that long, right? What else is on October 2nd? Just staffing. Okay. Why don't we combine those? Again. And do it on the second. Revenue and staffing on the second. On the second. We can do that. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, we have we'll plan. Okay. So the remaining components here are we do that next work session, perhaps accept some general combination of models, and then at a board meeting we would have action on it. That's sort of the next of the timeline or that's correct that's correct so it's essentially approving that work has been done related to the integrated resource plan and again the integrated resource plan doesn't have to be done we can discuss the integrated resource plan at any time it's really you know there's no dollars getting asked for there's no dollars getting spent it's it's just a plan going forward and, and as we go spend those dollars whenever that demand does come up right we got to come back through 
through you to ask for those dollars, whatever those dollars may exist. So, yeah. not only that, it's got to be the part of the budget that we have to yeah. go through that process. Part of it may be, you know, where do we bring in the uh, dollars to pay for this? So, more likely to be part of a may, may be part of a bond request, maybe a PPA or something that'll still have to come in, you know, through those conversations. So, again, it's yeah, I, 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 I tend to look at this, I mean, I know it's different, so I'm not trying to make it the same, but but it's like we have 20 year master plans for electric, at, at, at one time, like 20 year master plans for our water department, okay? So those were plans we really didn't take to the back to the board for approval, but it was plans that, okay, we, we had Black and Beach, Burns and Max, somebody else help us out developing those. And then over 20 years, based on what we see today, we think we're gonna, have to do all these things, okay? But in most of those cases, it didn't work out that way, and the, the certain things, certain conditions changed along the way. And as as we worked through all that, we had those conversations with the board on an ongoing basis, on an annual basis, doing budget, doing all the other things, and then provided feedback as to here's now what we did, what we've done, or where we are with the project after the board approves the, the funding for it. So it becomes a continuing dialogue for forever almost. Yeah. So, but it is it's just a snapshot in time based on where we see the, the world in the next 20, 20 years or so. But it's not etched in stone. There's a lot of things that's got to happen. There's a lot of things that's going to probably, EPA and others is going to probably force us to change direction on a number of things. Now that was but at least, my initial question to you, Ingrid, because... Past experiences show that things do change. Right, even right, though right. Yes, and we're at the election time. Exactly. <laughs> so, yes, my world changes every four years. <laughs> when I was listening to 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 her talk about the financials, so it'd be good to have some idea as to what we're looking at in the right. future. Yes, so. and, <laughs> and you know we we model this and we say, oh, CCS Nearman could run forever if we did it, even though it may not do that as it's just a reserve, but. You know, that by that time, there's going to be something else, right? Uh, so, I mean, like Bill saying, it, it's always it's ever changing. It's a living document, basically. Right. But we're doing a responsible thing today by saying, okay, you know, let's document, let's present, let's yeah. get some type of consensus approval around. Here's how we what we think the world may look like, knowing that it probably won't look like this in in future years, and and we'll certainly make those those adjustments when the time comes. But, but it's really not an approval. This is more of an acknowledgement that some pretty drastic suggestions, I think, of changes from our current process. Uh, I was going to propose a pretty modest uh, tweak uh, to get us through this year, which is maybe going through the process as planned. But once we have sort of, okay, we finished that next work session, extending one more window for public comment or input with all 10 scenarios having been looked at since the original window was we had base case and we had, I think, the four others. Um, I don't know if, you know, that's the appropriate conversation for now or the next work session since we've got another sort of hurdle in that line. But thought just, and one of the things that sparked this a little bit too is um, Jeremy sent a couple models from others uh, that he looked at, which were really pretty similar to what we do. I think the one change was, they were a little bit more robust on that public input session. So it felt like the most modest week would just be with all scenarios on the board. People have emails they want to send in or public comments, just having a window for that to happen. One meeting, I don't know when that would be, you know, if we're talking September for the next work session, early mid October for that, or before it's officially, okay, we're setting that aside for the, you know, yeah, <laughs> next five years or, or whatever that may be. Right now is the time to bring it up. Okay. So we can uh, we can at least uh, lay out our 
calendars are scheduled for uh, next month and the month after, and uh, and then the you know, also make sure we're accounting for all the other things that we need. Right. To <laughs> so stack it up here, aren't they? Because we're looking at work session potentially September eighteenth or the fourth. Uh, Work section for to, to, to review the sort of final report with the costs. So. I thought we were going to maybe go do it on the 18th because that would give Kill time, to, more time to digest it. Right. So 18th work for you. Sure. So we'll, we'll circle back on the next IRP, Tom. I think I heard on the 18th. If you said that's, I think that was what the consensus was. So then I guess what I'd be pitching is some one of either of those October meetings that, you know, we carve out a little bit of time on the agenda for final public comments, feedback on the whole set of models. Similar, I could, like the format we did before, but. Well, and, and so, um, and I don't recall what meeting this was at, maybe two meetings ago now, um, not inclusive of tonight that bill you had some interaction and or discussion with um the, the one party that has commented more than the other so the sierra club right so right when ty has been here i think he was here in person right and talked about the possibility of getting an nda right and, and understanding that there are some you know there's there's uh, operationally sensitive confidential information that cannot be shared. Right. And, you know, I've, I've seen what the staff response is, you know, to some of that in here and that, and that's fine. But have you guys had a separate conversation with them at this point about entering into an NDA or, or no, because it, it sounds like from the response, the answer is no, but I, I want to confirm that. So you guys met Friday yeah, let me go back. So we we collectively met with him on on I'll say some of these topics related to, to this type of stuff and some other topics as well. Um, but no, we we have not directly we collectively met with them when it's been a, a few weeks back. I, I don't remember the date. Um, he came into the office and and met with several of us. Um, but no, we have not reached out specifically and and given him an NDA or, and those type of things at this point. Um, but we are we are open to sharing data so that their modeling firm can can review that and, you know, again, work with us on, on different things that they think of. Everything's assumption-based, right? Everybody's going to have their own assumptions on, on future costs, on future benefit, all, all of those things. And um, their firm would as, as well. And we're, we're more than open to discussing those with them and with the board, so... Do you staff has had an internal conversation last Friday? Yes. Right. So just yep. haven't moved beyond that internal conversation Correct. yet. Do you need a board action to move forward with that? I mean, and David probably can attest to this too. I know a lobbyist, right? I've worked with a lot of them to be take take all, all the information with a grain of salt. On the other hand, if there's a group that wants to do modeling on their own dime and present us with one more set of information, I'm all for, you know, free services where we can get them. Um, so I, I guess the question for Bill or whoever, do you, would you need a, no, just, so just, my, we, we can, go ahead. My one caution is how do you screen who gets the data with an NDA and who doesn't? Because once you start selecting, um, you know, it's not like when you have an intervener and it's a very, Formal process. This is a different. Everyone can come in and speak and, and let their feelings be known. But then, how do you select who you're willing to to provide an NDA to and release that data, that sensitive data to? So that is my one caution: is how do you make those determinations that so that it's fair, but so that the utility is protected? Is that? I, I think the question was asked of you all during that public comment that. Is that the type of thing you have done in other places, had sort of third parties collaborating, or I don't know what the right verb is for that. But. Uh, not well, I know in contested proceedings you have. <laughs> um, we, our preference is um, we don't like to give 
any other third party information directly. Um, instead, we prefer our clients for, to choose and for all those exchanges to take place, like in this case, through BPU. Uh, that we, you know, that we, we wouldn't want to be the conduit for information, your sensitive information sure. to be shared with anyone. Uh, we would be happy to provide BPU with, you know, the inputs to the model that then you could choose to use sure. for, for whatever you need. What's an example of the sensitive information that we're talking about? What we... so, so the way that generation works within SVP is all generation submits bids into the marketplace. And so you're competing against every other generator in the market, right? So you got your heat rate, you have your fuel costs, you have, have these different specifics that are specific to your own generating source. And therefore, if, if an Evergy, for example, got information of that, they could utilize that information to move their own cost around to benefit from, from those things. So if they lower their cost, right, to be a, you, you see that in grocery stores, you see that in different things where somebody's going to be the low cost provider of a certain product. And, and so there's just certain things that you don't want. And, and, and as the SPP directly is, the marketing arm and the operations arm cannot speak together even at at firms like an Avergy, right? They have to have a hard walls between those because they don't want those interactions to occur. And so there's just certain things that are, I'll say sensitive. Um, it wouldn't be like the end of the world if, if, it, if it got out, but it wouldn't be good either. So uh, those things are just things that you have to be careful of. Trying to, trying to, to understand. So we're talking about providing information uh, who will we provide to be providing the information to? Sierra Club. Or their, their, or their, or their analysts. Or their analysts. Yeah. What was it? Rocky Mountain. Syn Synapse. Synapse, okay. That's really who they generally use for their, and that's who they used, I'll say, in regards to the cost of service that we, we did a few years back. And so um, the idea would be is that a firm such as Synapse, an, an actual firm that does modeling, would likely be the firm that we would release the data sure, to. They sense. could release their findings to collectively to all of us, right? And so that is the idea behind the sharing. Um, but if you guys have other preferences or ideas. Is, okay. is there a criteria to, that would, you know, get to Angie's point? Because that makes sense, right? Um, I don't want to be seen as my assumption is there's not just dozens of outside firms wanting to do their own modeling here, but I understand the, the fairness of that. Like, is there a criteria we could set where it has to be a certain kind of modeling firm, or I think we could at the very least look at a timeline of, hey, this is our public comment window. Anyone interested in that has to, you know, submit a request by that deadline. I know that doesn't completely get down to the criteria you might be choosing on, but. No, the, the, those are good questions. And I think we can kind of, determine hopefully in-house if, if we can come up with a conclusion that makes the most sense in terms of what that would look like. Uh. Just the other decision is how they, the determination would be how will they use the information once they receive it, okay? And then other than Sierra Club, are there anybody else that they would share just information with? Well, I and then we wouldn't be giving it to the Sierra Club. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that would be my hope. I'm sorry. Hopefully, we'll not be giving it to the Sierra Club, but to the to the firm. Uh, that that was why I asked who would we be giving it to, because Sierra Club would have no use for it because they won't be doing anything with it. It would be their their the firm, the Rocky Mountain, whoever. Uh, yes. It would be their firm that would be looking at it. If, if we disclose disclose it to them, uh, uh, then then the NDA would, would be to them only yeah. and for them only. Right. I wouldn't expect it to, to leave there with, you know, within that agreement. If so, then we'd have, we'd have Correct. you know, that's a <laughs> legal point. Could you could that be part of the terms of the NDA is, you know, the disclosure is a presentation to the BPU or just whatever format would be, you know, our standard practice that that be the only and it, it could, we would just have to sit down and make sure that, that we have that conversation. Right. 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 But that's exactly the thought. And, and that, that firm has a reason to follow that NDA closely because they have clients such as ourselves all around the globe. So just like Black & Beach doesn't want to disclose information is you don't want to become those yeah. firms. And so, um, yes, they would be more careful likely with, with that information. 
Um, Angie, do we have the ability to issue a protective order with respect to a specific issue, in this case, the IRP? We, the board does not. I mean, there's no, there's no built-in ability to issue an order to a third party. So we couldn't issue a gen, the, the body could not issue, and I'm thinking in terms of non-disclosure certificates, right? So I'm thinking in terms of a contested case, right? Um, that you have before a regulated body. And so if I want access to that information, I have to read the protective order and I have to sign a thing right. or a penalty of perjury that says I'm not going to do the thing. And I've had this, right. right. I had to sign this too. Right. JC. So we can't do that. I'm not aware of anything that um, grants authority to the board to, I will look for that, but I, I'm not aware of anything that grants authority to this body um, to. Does the UG that. have it? I, I don't no, I don't believe they would have that either. Ooh. Ooh, the UG would have it either? I don't believe they would, but I will. I will certainly so for, look at both. for purposes with the utility. To the extent we have anything that's trade secret that would be protected under trade secret law. Oh, yeah. yeah. What do we do with it? So we, just, we do the NDAs for those. Just an NDA. Yes. And, and we we can extract the data that that we would feel personally. Oh, I'm confident yeah. we yeah. could. And, I mean, we have. It shouldn't be that difficult. And then yeah. we also have, you know, for some of it, depending on what it is, um, you know, how it's going to be disposed of, if it's going to be returned. Sure. So we have, well, we've done all of that mm -hmm. in our agreements <laughs> with companies. But... Could, could a next step on this then be staff and legal side to sort of come up with the terms that we would be comfortable with or the criteria we would be comfortable with? And that could, would be could be fairly implemented right. because that's, you know, I just want to make sure that it's something that we can fairly implement Absolutely. when someone requests it. And we're not just, you're not stuck with arbitrarily or yeah. staff not deciding who gets what. Right. So we will, we will attempt to craft something to bring to the board. Thank you. So have you had the conversation with this firm directly or just Sierra club? Just, uh, so we haven't had any discussions outside of our previous conversation with Sierra club. Um, but no, I mean, we're familiar with Synapse a little bit. They, they're the ones who presented before, but, um, no, we, we have some documents that we would, we can work on to and have those discussions and, and see where that goes, but we got to craft something internally. So sounds like a plan. Um, if there's no other questions, we can get on the IRP customer and external comments. Um, so this kind of goes into some of the stuff we are actually talking about here. Um, so, so at the same time that we began the integrated resource process, uh, VPU reached out to those large firms that would be eligible to participate under the Green Rider program. So when we did the cost of service here a few years back, we implemented a Green Rider program. And that essentially allows those large customers that want to become more renewable in nature to do so without putting that cost and burden on, on it, all other rate payers. And so we have approximately 20 customers that are eligible under that Green Rider program. We sent surveys to each of those customers and we see, received two responses back. Um, both responses indicated that their organization was in, interested in increased levels of renewables on the system. Both indicated that their organization believe additionality or the act of bringing a new resource online is important to their organization. Both organizations indicated that they would potentially be open to participating under a 25 year arrangement. 25 years is generally the length of time that you do a purchase power agreement for on a solar project, for example. Um, many firms want to do shorter projects, right? At like a 10 year window. And then the the organization such as BPU would be responsible for those last 15. And so you got to determine what those costs are for, for doing that. But these both of these firms were willing to do full 25 year arrangements. Um, and both organizations understood that the cost to participate in the program was likely going to be higher than their current base rates uh, that they pay today. So 
how the green rider may impact future generation decisions, it's really under the current base case assumptions, we don't expect any new generation likely to be required in the near to medium term. As you've seen, we had paper capacity really filling out that term out to 2038. Um, but the Green Rider is really a program that allows large customers that ability to bring on new, new renewables into the system. And, and really all the costs and all the revenues associated with those projects that are brought online are borne by those participants in the program directly. Um, so if those customers and potentially others within that, those rate classes chose to participate in that program, what it would really act to do is it would reduce the need for the additional capacity because obviously as we brought on a, a new solar facility for these large customers, our need for capacity would shrink and therefore it would eat into that paper capacity and, and potentially other generating needs that we have. So it would act as a benefit to the whole, even though those participants would would bear the brunt, brunt of that cost. Next slide, please. So this is really one of the many benefits of expecting to have a relatively long window before long-term investment is needed, is that we can explore these options such as the Green Rider, such as that community solar that we discussed a little bit previously. Um, those type of programs allow you to meet, meet that capacity requirements through other mechanisms without going with that large investment that we talk about in 2038 and beyond. Um, so really the potential investment is used to replace a portion of that paper capacity um, within the model. So really the goal of the program, such as the Green Rider, is to allow those larger customers the ability to acquire greener energy options while allowing them to gain the economies of scale and utilizing the utility expertise to manage those activities. And so instead of them being in the energy business, it allows them to buy smaller pieces of a large scale utility scale project. So reduces the cost for everyone. Next slide. Please. So we, we received two comments uh, directly as part of the IRP, or I should say comments from two individuals. Um, one was from the Sierra Club, and then one was from another individual uh, here locally. Um, so the Sierra Club obviously made verbal comments, so you know what those verbal comments are. I believe you also have uh, the physical paper of, of what they wrote in writing. Um, but really, the comments related to both in person and in writing uh, is, although the Sierra Club uh, <laughs> intended to, uh, sorry, they really provided three talking points, primarily in their documents. And those, doc and those preferences were to conduct annual IRP capacity expansion modeling updates. They were to consider FERC Order 1920, which is the regional transmission planning. And then it was FERC Order 2222, which is RTO, Regional Transmission Organization, directed de demand, demand response. Um, and then they asked staff to work with third-party organizations to provide transparent modeling details, um, what we just discussed. Next slide, please. So really in regards to the annual IRP process, staff does not feel the value is sufficient to justify the cost commitment requirement. So obviously all of this has cost. Black & Beach does not do this for free. It is a time commitment. What you can do, obviously, as you look at all of these processes, is this is a planning exercise. And as you get closer to those needs for additional generation, you can go through this exercise, whether it's on your five-year window or not on your five-year window, right? But but those are explored as you get closer to those milestones that you go through. So we do not believe an annual process um, suffices for the cost commitment required. In terms of considering FERC Order 1920, which is regional transmission planning, and FERC Order 2222, which is RTO direct demand response, staff is and will continue to work with SPP and potentially the state on both of those FERC initiatives. Uh, so really the goal of FERC Order 1920 is to provide better regional transmission planning so as to better unlock current generation sources as well as new generation location and to better serve the load on a regional basis. 
There is currently some litigation associated with this matter, um, but there's also some agreement to attempt to collectively examine transmission and transmission processes. So FERC Order 1920 is a process primarily directed at RTOs such as SPP and states, and BPU will be one of that, those voices in that conversation. So we are just one of many that will be contributing to those. But those discussions are ongoing today um, between SPP. With, so SPP manages, you know, 14 states regionally already. Um, but SPP and MISO, MISO handles, I'll say, more East Ripley, uh, regional transmission operator. So those also are having discussions on this transmission planning. And so it's really just an exercise that we will be a part of, uh, but we won't lead any of those discussions as, as a much broader topic than, than we would generally touch. In regards to FERC Order 2222, uh, the BPU is exploring and monitoring the process and impacts of demand response associated with that FERC order. Uh, the BPU is not currently required to participate under FERC Order 2222 due to being a small utility. Um, large utilities, which are greater than 4 million megawatt hours annually, or about 2.6 million megawatt hours annually, just FYI, uh, they are required to participate. And so SPP and those large utilities are currently working through the growing pains of that new market. Um, it is expected that once that market matures, BPU would likely participate in that program. So as we see those pain points get alleviated, it will be easier for us small utilities to participate in that program. And so we do, we do think it has value going forward. And we do anticipate that demand response, especially at the RTO level, uh, will be an attractive measure for our customer, uh, virtual power plants, and those type of things. But you, we don't want to be the ones spending all the dollars to try to get to that, that point. And so the larger utilities, those such as Evergy and so forth, they are required to participate. And so the SPP and those large utilities are working through all those pain points. And uh, we believe it has merit, and we believe it gets there, but it, it'll be a challenge to, to do so. Uh, in regards to the third party modeling, uh, as we stated, BPU is willing to work with those third party modeling organizations and is willing to provide as granular of data as possible with understanding that some of that data is commercially and competitively sensitive. Um, any share, sharing of data will require affidavits and NDAs and thus the process to provide the data and to examine and discuss a potential result will be a relatively lengthy process. Obviously, we've been going through this process for a while. So even if a firm such as Synapse wants to get this data, it will likely come outside of the integrated resource pro planning process, and therefore they can present or we can present those findings as those come in. Um, but yeah, and next slide, please. Oh, and, and questions. So I did receive, as I mentioned, received one other late comment uh, from an individual here in the community. And uh, I'll, I'll read it verbatim because it's not very long. And just to... This is from an individual named Amber Adams. Uh, she said, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation to submit comment. I would, however, hope for there to be an opportunity for public input once the report has been released. And so that kind of goes along with your comments earlier. Um, if, if you want to extend that window so that people could comment again, based off of that final report that Black Beach does. Uh, but those were the only two individuals that have commented associated with the integrated resource plan. And is that the woman that accompanied Ty to our meeting when we met with Ty here internally? It is. And she represents Vibrant Health? She does. Yes, That's what I, said. I don't know if she's representing Vibrant Health as part of this comment. She does She does have that in her signature. I don't, I don't want to assume that she represents or doesn't represent, but yes, okay. we did meet with her um, with Mr. Gorman a few weeks back, just again, talking about a number of topics. So one of the things that there was the staff response on was, you know, the rec 
suggestion that there be an annual process. The it's the the modeling is the and staff time going to that is the main driver of cost there, right? It is. So things like we have know the next four years of administration after an election, revisiting some of those particulars with the modeling that's already been done as the backdrop are things that will happen on a regular basis as some of those, or as the legal landscape changes. It's not as, so, so that's not doing the IRP annually, but it's still a chance to touch on some of those key factors that we're looking at. Correct. And, and, and as we, you know, get through this election cycle, right, it, it's, it may give us an indication of some of those directions we may want to look closer at, whether it be the EPA. Well, the right legal or, challenges, I was going to say, could take years, right? So, again, it's annual remodeling is not going to necessarily be beneficial whatsoever. And then I had a question on the, the green rider piece. In, in essence, would a customer that wants to, or assuming or large customers want to participate in that, they would be more or less paying a premium rate to offset a capital project to provide renewable energies or a purchase agreement or some new source of generation that's renewable? Is that how the mechanics of that would work? Yes. So, so effectively is... So it, it would be an iterative process between all of those entities that want to participate. And so we would look at all the different project types, whether it be, I'll say, solar, wind, what have you. They're choosing those, those projects based off, I assume, you know, the number of reps that they receive, the, whether they have preferences for solar, wind, and, and those type of things. And so collectively... We would expect to decide on, on either one project or multiple projects, and therefore we would likely do a purchase power agreement. And so a purchase power agreement is where we agree to pay a certain price per megawatt hour of, of product, right? And so they would effectively in turn through a mechanism effectively pay that, that cost for that energy. And then that cost is effect or that that energy is effectively sold into the marketplace and it receives revenue for that sale and they would receive that revenue. And so those, those are the outcomes, but generally the cost of the PPA is more than the revenue that's generated through the marketplace. And so generally speaking, it would be a net cost. There would be months where it'd be a, a net revenue, but generally speaking over time, it would likely be a net cost unless the market changed to those customers, to those customers. Okay. And so the idea behind it is that any of you not participating in those programs won't be ill affected by the decision that you want to be 100% green or this guy wants to be 100% green. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? How many of our customers are in that large customer class. So the, the eligible customers that would be eligible for this program, there are 20 of them. 20, I think you said that. And then, yeah, and so we'll see, we received two comments back. That doesn't mean that others wouldn't be. Some are corporate, you know, larger, I'll say national, international companies. Some are more local companies. So they all have different thoughts in terms of who's buying what and how they're doing it. but. Um, we would continue to reach out to try to expand that portfolio from those two customers that showed interest. And again, everything's going to be cost-based, right? So we're going to go out and explore what the cost of those purchase power agreements would be. And, and they'll decide over time as to whether how much they're willing to spend on that deal. And so we may get to a point where they're like, it's too much or it's a, hey, we can make that happen here. So there's nothing further. We need to adjourn and move into the next meeting. Entertain a motion. I move to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and say roll call, please. Roll call, Gonzalez. Aye. Brenneman. Aye. Haley. Aye. Wakes. Aye. Mulvaney Henry. Aye. Parker. That motion carries. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>